will take a moment to remember, feel inspired and celebrate the indomitable spirit and passion of two fearless and bold tobacco control leaders. Adam Amteshwar Kaur, senior lawyer, a tobacco control advocate, three times counsellor in Punjab and founder of Generation Saviour Association, GSA, which is striving for a tobacco-free Punjab state in India, is no more amongst us. But as the wisdom goes, the goal is not to live forever. The goal is to create something that will. Her organization, the Generation Saviour Association, continues to strive for a better world and is led by someone Madam Kaur inspired the most, Opinder. Another light that went away last year from our lives but continues to inspire us in our work on daily basis is of Yul Francisco Dorado, who was the Latin America Director of Corporate Accountability International and a leader with Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals from Colombia. We at CNS have fortunately worked with him closely as part of the NAT team. Use incredible body of work in challenging big tobacco and other development justice initiatives lives on. Perhaps one of the most inspired by Yul is Daniel Dorado, his loving son and a lawyer in his own right who is one of those keeping youth's legacy alive, vibrant and fierce, and striving hard for a better world. Daniel is online with us today. Welcome, Daniel, as we celebrate youth's courage over the years in challenging injustices. Over to you now. Hey, thank you very much for this important space to remind my, my, my dad's legacy, Jules Dorado, uh, as the panelist has already introduced me, my name is Daniel Dorado. I have been collaborating the last year with Corporate Accountability International, uh, developing some things to share about Article 19. And it is very special for me that you dedicate this space to talk a little bit about my dad, about his vision, about his thoughts about World No Tobacco Day. In, for my dad, I will think this the World No Tobacco Day is a day to think about and to rethink about all the potential of the FCTC. I think he will say that the FCTC is a dynamic instrument that always has to evolve. And as all the panelists have told today, it has a lot of potential to include many topics, such as the sustainable developing goals, that as a matter of fact, uh, highlights my dad's vision of how tobacco control will impulse or highlight other fields such as climate change, such as consumer rights, such as economic topics. Tobacco control not only has to be seen as a, a health topic, it has to be as an holistic thing that must contribute to, to develop other human rights around the world. And finally, I would like to say that as, as my father and many of you will know, that for continue developing the FCTC, we must strong our relationships among others. The FCTC and all its potential will develop if we work together, if we strong all our relationships around the world, if we think that tobacco control is a human right issue. Thank you very much for this space. Thank you very much for reminding his legacy. And whatever I can do to continue his fight, I will 
be honored to continue helping you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Governments of more than 190 countries globally have committed to reduce premature deaths caused by non-communicable diseases by one-third by 2030 by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN General Assembly in September 2015. Tobacco is a major risk factor for not just major NCDs but also thwarts development. Today we will learn more on why tobacco endgame is imperative for sustainable development. But before we begin, let me make a few quick announcements as always. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions in using chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen. Also, those of you who are live tweeting or posting on social media, please use the hashtag no tobacco, okay, thanks. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsarup, who is a widely acclaimed international award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with more than 43 years of experience in journalism. He was the senior program producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation. Over to you, Ashok. Warm greetings from the port city of Durban, South Africa. Did you know tobacco-related disease and death is preventable? We can avert this avoidable burden of disease and deaths that are crippling not only our health systems, but also jeopardizing development of our populations all over the world. We have a luminary panel of experts who will share important insights shortly. Well, without any further ado, let me introduce the experts for this first session. Professor Ramakant, WHO, World Health Organization Director General's awardee, noted tobacco control advocate over four decades and former national president of Association of Surgeons of India, Michelle Reyes, technical advisor to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and lung disease or the union. Chloe Franco, senior international organizer at the Corporate Accountability International and part of leadership at a network for accountability of tobacco transnationals. Well, let's get the show going. Professor Dr. Ramakant has been on these webinars as a senior expert on health issues, a noted health advocate and WHO Director General's awardee. He is a former head of surgery, Department of King George's Medical University, and former chief medical superintendent of Gandhi Memorial and Associated Hospitals. Now it's over to Professor Ramakant. Well, welcome, uh, Doctor. Thank you very much, Ashok. It's a pleasure talking about it. Uh, friends, uh, you know, you've already heard that this causes preventable death. So I'll try to, you know, cover that topic. Okay. Tobacco kills up to half of its users. And for your information, one third of the world population is tobacco addict, and one third is suffering from poverty, and one third is suffering from tuberculosis. And somehow the other, these three are related. Tobacco kills more than 7 million people each year, and about 6 million, 6, 6 million are di dying because of the direct tobacco use, while well, nearly 1 million, precisely 8.9 lakhs, are dying because of passive smoking, which because of somebody smoking in, in the vicinity. Tobacco users who die prematurely deprive their families of income, they raise the cost of health care, and hinder the economic development. This, uh, the use is a threat to any person, regardless of gender, age, race, cultural, or educational background. It brings suffering, disease, and death impoverishing families and national economies. Tobacco use costs national economic economies enormously through increased health care costs and decreased productivity because they cannot attend their duties well, they are on leave many times, and exacerbates poverty as the poorest people spend less on essential things like food, education, and health care. 80% premature deaths from tobacco occur in low or middle income countries, which is a matter of concern and which 
face already increased challenges to achieving their developmental goals. The four important things which I take in, in summary, the key non-communicable disease of child killing by, because of tobacco, one of the most important is the heart disease and strokes. Next is cancer of different types from lung cancer, oral cancer and so many others. And then diabetes has got a strong link with this. Not only it multiplies, on the same time it is two, two times, you know, it exposes more people to become diabetic when somebody is smoking. And chronic respiratory diseases leading up to the corporal pulmonary and serious conditions and even death, these four things become very significant. Now secondhand smoke, which led ultimately to banning the smoking, well, that is important, which fills restaurant offices or all closed spaces where somebody is burning tobacco, beauty or water pipes. There are more than 4,000 chemicals in tobacco smoke, of which at least 250 are known to be harmful and more than 50 are known to cause cancer. They're called carcinogenic. Friends, there's no safe level of exposure to secondhand tobacco smoke. Nobody can say that uh, when somebody can develop a complication. Then in adults, the serious complications occur in cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, in coronary heart disease, Burgess disease, which causes the limb loss, and lung cancer. And in infants, this leads to a syndrome called a sudden death syndrome. In pregnant women, low birth weight can be there for the baby, abortions, congenital deformities can be there, and mental retardation of the, of the fetus also can occur. Almost half of the children regularly breathe air polluted with tobacco smoke. In 2004, children accounted for 28% or less attributable to secondhand smoke. Every person should be able to breathe tobacco free air. That is responsibility of all of us. If you see the prevalence, here it really, you will find that the things are on, still on rise. Youth, you can see this data is from 31st December 2014 survey. And here you can see youth which is using tobacco. This is current use around 19. And you can see when you look for adult tobacco smoking, then you find 18.3 and then currently it becomes 10.3. Females if initially, if you see start, starting from 8.3 and gradually you'll find this also is becoming better, more and more, uh, I think, higher in, in the incidence. Then similarly, you see smokeless tobacco, which is a concern for some countries like India, China, Pakistan, other countries, but this is gradually spreading all over. Here you find nearly three times in youth smoke, 11.1%, and while adult smoke, 32.9%, and then here female also nearly three times, six here, and 18.4%. So this is not a good situation. Then e-cigarettes I want to mention especially because a lot of confusion is created by these things. Beware, don't be duped. Most e-cigarettes and other forms of electronic nicotine delivery system have not been tested by independent scientists or researchers. No reliable data and scientific evidence if ends help in tobacco quitting, which they claim commonly. Nicotine is the addictive component of tobacco which has been found to be not only affecting pregnancy and causing addiction, on the same time also contributing to CVD, cardiovascular diseases, and this has been proved to be tumor promoter, so it can cause even cancer. Nicotine seems involved in fundamental aspects of the biology of the malignant disease, and in addition, it increases the exposure of non-smokers and bystanders to nicotine and number of toxicants, and therefore, these should be completely banned to be used in, in such situations. Then another part is not a lot of people think that using you know, water pipe or shisha or hookah, they feel possibly the things are not that harmful because they pass it through water. But this is absolutely wrong. A common misconception should be very clear that during a one hour shisha session, a user can inhale the same amount of smoke from water pipe as from 100 cigarettes. You can imagine that part. And it must be banned from all indoor public places within the comprehensive and well-enforced smoke-free law. And therefore, that concept should be very clear that even what passing through the water, it is lethal. Then, very important to mention here, as I said in the first you know, sentence, the tuberculosis, then on the same time poverty, and then you find that the, the tobacco addiction, these three things have got a great link. Tuberculosis, <clears throat> you will be surprised to see that there's a strong association. And you can see the graph with, which you find in India and China and South, especially South Africa. You can find that wherever you find that the TB cases are higher and they are also 
using more of tobacco. Smoking substantially increases the risk for TB, and 20% of the global TB incidence is attributable to smoking. And smoking is a risk factor for TB, and this increases the risk to a disease by more than two and a half times, we commonly say around three times. Diabetes has got a similar association. You find that smoking doubles the risk of diabetes among the healthy population. And smoking and alcohol may alter the risk of diabetes through long-term effects on insulin secretion and insulin resistance. A study show how tobacco use dangerously increase risk of CBD, cancers, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, etc. COPD, one of the greatest killer, which, which is caused by smoking commonly, and smoking accounts for nearly 8 out of 10 COPD related deaths. Smoking during childhood and teenage years can slow lungs growth and development, and this can increase the risk of developing COPD in adulthood. Friends, here is very clear tobacco use can worsen poverty and tobacco poverty can worsen tobacco use because not only illiteracy on the same time poor resources they opt for cheaper things like this and they go for tobacco addiction which kills them tobacco cessation like they to touch because all you know efforts or to control tobacco will be failing unless we are able to provide cessation services in short it's a very long topic but i'll try to summarize that figure strong grading is done for assessing the extent and intensity of the addiction. Then psychological assessment is done, counseling of the individual, then coping of the stress factors and triggers, family counseling is done, then you can use so many resources, whatever source, yoga, meditation, herbal, acupuncture, religious faith, all these things can be utilized, they should be combined. Planning a date of cessation should be done, declaring the date, bold day and family counseling again, prepare them for that period of cessation and using children or some important event for cessation, pharmacotherapy by bupropion or NRT, treatment of comorbidities and reassessment of cessation by repeatedly maintaining sputum, blood for cotinine, CO monitoring, etc. Then a very important question I would like to ask, which pathy is successful in cessation? You can ask me, friends, allopathy, homeopathy, herbal, acupuncture, electropathy, naturopathy, tibia, or any other pathy, there are so many here and all over the world. No pathy is successful unless there is sympathy. I've been involved in cessation also for a long time. And I found unless you, you are sympathetic, you are a part of it, you cannot achieve quitting. The process is very simple in this graph. You can see you start from pre-contemplation, prepare them to contemplation. Then you prepare their methods, which I have already mentioned. Then there is an action. Remember, friends, any, from any stage, the smoker can call or tobacco user can come back to relapse. But don't be frustrated, every stair is taking, taking him to success. Maintenance is done by checking again and again, an ex-smoker sometimes can be there, they should be rewarded, and do so many methods to you know, stimulate them, making them product champion. Then bupropion SR is one of the drugs which is non-nicotine, which can be used for cessation. Nicotine lozenges can be used under very strict guard and supervision. Patches are also there. Combining patches along with the NRT can also be helpful in some patients. So with these things, what we understand is that cessation should be as strong as our efforts to control tobacco so that we ensure this world a tobacco-free world and pure air. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ramakant. Always enlightening to hear from you. Let us now listen to Michelle Reyes, technical advisor on tobacco control to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and lung disease or the union. It's now over to you, Michelle Reyes. For this particular campaign, uh, there are two things that they would like to highlight. First is to demonstrate on the threats of the industry to sustainable development, particularly on the health and economic well-being. And number two, um, it seeks to actually highlight also uh, the uh, uh, highlight the measures that uh, the government has to take or even civil society in order to promote health and development uh, by confronting the global tobacco crisis. So in this next slide, we will show how the industry poses threat to sustainable development. So as earlier mentioned by the previous speaker, uh, and, and, and probably most of us know, uh, tobacco use or what we call commonly call as smoking is estimated to cause nearly 10% of um, 
cardiovascular disease and uh, it is also the second leading cause of CBD next to uh, high blood pressure. And also, the effects of tobacco use is not only um, confined to uh, direct smokers, but also those that are exposed to it. So, um, that being said, nearly 6 million people die from tobacco use or exposure to secondhand smoke. So, in this particular slide, you will see I have cited the 2015 Global Adult Tobacco Survey in the Philippines, where it showed that... Um, 41.9% in men are current tobacco users, which means they are using any tobacco product, either smoke and or smokeless, while tobacco users in women is at 58.5.8% uh, rather. In G's, nearly one out of Filipino adults still use tobacco or is into smoking. Um, aside from uh, tobacco use and its ill effects, the industry also poses threat to the economic well-being. So for this particular slide, you will see the percentage of um, monthly expenditure of the, of the poor. So in the chart, you will see that a poor household uh, spends most of its finances on food um, at 59.9%. Next is on vices such as tobacco and alcohol at 2.7%, then on health at 1.7 percent and education at 1.2 percent so at the lower right uh, of the screen you will see there the um a table uh, uh with the heading economics now it's based on the 2015 GATS also uh and it, it mentions that the average monthly expenditure for cigarette among cigarette smokers cost around 678.4 pesos or uh, roughly around 13 uh, dollars uh, overall, while men spend around 696 pesos or 13, also 13.9 US dollars, and women spend roughly around 515 pesos or is equivalent to 10 US dollars. Just imagine uh, a poor household giving primacy on uh, tobacco and alcohol use over health and even education, more so on food and other basic needs. So aside from uh, demonstrating the threat as one of the, um, um, what do you call this, um, objectives of the World No Tobacco Day theme, uh, it also highlights on the proposed measure that governments or even civil society need to take in order to promote health and development. So one of the proposed measure is for... Uh, countries to prioritize and accelerate tobacco control efforts as part of their responses to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So in the SDGs, we have um, 17 goals represented by each of these colorful boxes uh, with 169 targets using uh, 230 indicators, which hopefully will be achieved in 15 years. So um, health is uh, uh, placed under goal number three. So in the previous slide, I have mentioned that um, SDG number three is on achieving good health. So in order to um, accelerate tobacco control efforts, uh, parties to uh, to the SDGs have identified that uh, one way to achieve the that particular goal is through target three point A, which is strengthening the implementation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in all countries. So as of present. There are 180 countries that are parties to the SCTC and 168 have signed or ratified the treaty. So in order to realize this FCTC, WHO devised the Empower Strategy in order to assist uh, country-level implementation uh, for effective interventions to reduce the demand for tobacco. So, for, so Empower actually uh, stands for Different Strategies um, in order to uh, effectively implement FCTC. So for M, uh, it stands for monitor, P for protect, O for offer to help, to quit, and then W for warn, E for enforce, and then R to raise taxes. So for the Philippines, uh, we ratified FCTC in 2005 and has adopted the Empower strategy to actually implement it. So on the next slide, you will see um, and in the next few couple of slides, you will see um, what the Philippines did um, and what are the achievements made by the Philippines so far after they 
are after they have uh, adopted or ratified FCTC and also implemented the Empower strategy. So, uh, the Philippines was able to put into place some policy intervention in order to support both. So, one of which is the enactment of the Republic Act 10351 or the Senate Tax Reform Law. So, uh, in this slide, we'll see there that it is one of the landmark legislations under the Act. Uh, former President Benigno Simeon Aquino's administration. So it's primarily uh, a health measure, but fundamentally it's a good governance measure. So it helps finance the universal health care program of the government. It also simplified the current excise tax system on alcohol and tobacco. Uh, it, it also fixed the long-standing structural weaknesses as well as addresses public health issues relating to alcohol and tobacco consumption. So that's the picture uh, where President uh, Aquino is seated on the front at the center wearing the glasses uh, and uh, surrounding him are the tobacco control advocates. Next, um, on this particular slide you will see the salient features of the Sin Tax Law. So um, there are like five salient features of it. Uh, and uh, I'll just quickly run through it. Um, it says there are significant tax increase, so it effectively discourages smoking and excessive drinking and simultaneously generate ample revenues of public services. It also has a feature of a unitary tax rate. So having that, we discourage downshifting by reducing the price gap among brands through the implementation of a uniform tax rate. And then there is a, what you call as automatic annual increases. So it increases the tax rate by 4% every year to prevent increasing cigarette and alcohol affordability. And then uh, removal of the price classification fees. Uh, all brands will pay taxes regardless of their current uh, uh, prices. And then earmarking for health and farmers. So there's an incremental earmarking of incremental revenues uh, to be used to fund the uh, universal health care as well as alternative livelihood programs. So in the next slide, you will see that the revenues from excise taxes on tobacco and alcohol remained constant um, in the year 1998 up until 2012. But the turning point is actually on 2012 when the sin tax law was passed. Uh, so both taxes uh, in alcohol and tobacco increased significantly. So in the graph, you will notice that the tobacco excise taxes surged from uh, 25 billion to as high as 70.69 billion in a span of three years uh, implementing the sin tax law. In the next slide, you will see that um, uh, the budget of the Ministry of Health uh, as a trend is increasing, but it continues to do so after 2012 when the sin tax law was passed and in great leaps. So after the law was passed, um, uh, in, in 2012, you will see that the budget of the Ministry of Health from 53.23 billion increased to as high as 122.63 billion of la in last year. So um, basically, the proceeds of that sin tax law, 80% of which is um, allocated for universal health care, while the 20% is allocated for uh, medical assistance as well as um, the health facilities enhancement program. So through this health facilities enhancement program, the government was able to provide um, additional services like uh, putting up additional barangay health centers, um, uh, purchase of mobile dental clinics, as well as health centers in schools. Um, for the universal health care, they are able to uh, provide uh, additional coverage to ten uh, at least 10 million indigent Filipinos and uh, roughly around 2.8 million senior citizens. So in the next slide, you will see that the increase, the incremental uh, revenues that the Ministry of Health received out of the syntax proceeds were translated into an increased number of PhilHealth beneficiaries, which is subsidized by the government. So PhilHealth is the national insurance program of the Philippines. And it was created primarily to implement uh, universal health care coverage. As you can see from um, 2012, there's like 20 billion beneficiaries. And then it went up uh, three years after to cover 52 billion 
uh, beneficiaries. On the next slide, you will see here a picture of um, one of the uh, awardees for the Red Orchid Award. So aside from Syntax, um, the Philippines is also active in, um, in its subnational smoke-free advocacy. So the Ministry of Health has actually institutionalized an award or merit system for local government units. Uh, that's a collective term uh, we use to refer to cities, towns, and provinces, as well as uh, government offices that will adopt and effectively implement smoke-free policies in their respective areas or jurisdiction. So this award system is what we call the Red Orchid Award and is a brainchild of the incumbent health secretary, Pauline Obial. So... And as well, uh, aside from the syntax and also the smoke-free advocacy, the Philippines is also um, keen on um, curbing the tobacco industry interference. So um, uh, one way of doing that is by putting into place a national policy protecting the entire bureaucracy from tobacco industry interference. It is some sort of a localization of the Article 5.3 of the FCTC. So, uh, under that particular policy, it prohibits unnecessary interaction with the tobacco industry. So, um, what it meant was uh, interaction should be should only be limited to regulatory purposes. So outside regulatory purposes, they can they cannot interact with the industry. Uh, so, aside from that, it also prohibits accepting gifts, donations, and sponsorships. And the head of agency is responsible for actually informing all its employees regarding this policy. So a violation of this uh, is tantamount to a, gra uh, to a disciplinary action. Then aside from these three initiatives, you also um, have uh, made changes to our uh, to our PAC. So uh, in November 2016, we introduced or it was uh, fully implemented the graphic health warnings law. So if you can see in the screen, the left side is how our packs look like uh, prior to November 2016. So it only has the text warnings. Well, now it has the, the graphic health as, uh, and the text also um, is placed in a yellow box and um, compared to the, the picture on your left. So there are now uh, front and back of the pack ha, both have a graphic health warning and a text warning. Well, and the, the old warning only has uh, one message and one side of the pack. Uh, and you can only see it in one side of the pack. So um, uh, after all these initiatives, um, what what was probably, you, you can probably ask me, what are our achievements? So officially last May, uh, first week of May, that. 2015 GAFS result was uh, actually released. So it showed that um, uh, there's a dis significant decrease in uh, tobacco use uh, from 29.7% in 2009 to 23.8% in 2005. So it, the results confirm that the government's action to prevent and reduce uh, tobacco use are actually working. Uh, however, as I've mentioned in my previous slides, uh, nearly one in four Filipinos continue to use this deadly product. So since the first GATS was conducted in 2009, so um, the Philippines has taken bold action to address it. The epidemic, including uh, syntax to ensure steady increases in the prices of cigarettes, uh, but it needs to actually continue to implement evidence-based tobacco control policy. So it needs to actually protect the winds of the winds of the syntax law and ensure that there will be continued increases in tobacco excise tax. So on the next slide, you'll see there another result from the GATS, which uh, uh, showed that there's a significant decrease also in the exposure to secondhand smoke in public places. So from 25.5% uh, in 2009 to 13.6% in 2015. However, uh, secondhand smoke exposure continues to be alarmingly high in many public places, including bars and nightclubs. Uh, as you can see there in the, in the, in the chart, there's 
at 86.3%, public transpo at 37.6%, and restaurants at 33.6%. So, um, you may probably ask what contributed to the in to this decree. So, uh, basically, it's a combination of all all the initiatives that I I mentioned as well as the smoke-free ordinances or the FCTC compliant smoke-free ordinances being implemented by all the local government units. So aside from that, the, this, this uh, survey also showed that all surveyed Filipinos at 97.2% support a complete prohibition of smoking in indoor workplaces and uh, public places. So aside from that, um, the percentage of current smokers who thought of quitting smoking because of the health warnings on cigarette packages increased significantly from 37.4% uh, in 2009 to 44.6% in 2015. And then uh, the percentage of adults who noticed anti-cigarette smoking information at any location also increased significantly. So, um, Although this survey was done before the graphic health warning was law was actually fully implemented, I think most of the those that have actually seen the the initial templates um, uh, thought of it as as the law being implemented already. So uh, in a way, it helped because it 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 um, encouraged more people to act, uh, more smokers actually to to to, to quit. And then um, I'm down to my last slide. So just to promote, uh, as many of you know, the 17th World Conference on Tobacco and Health will be held in um, Cape Town, South Africa on March of 2018. So it will gather together researchers, NGOs, civil society, healthcare professionals, uh, public officials working on all aspects of uh, tobacco control for more than 100 countries. So for this uh, event, the team will be uniting the world for the for a con tobacco free generation. It is uh, particularly relevant to the topic of the webinar today, as it recognizes the tobacco control as a global issue that needs a sustainable solution. So we hope the participants in this webinar will be able to join us in Cape Town next March. Um, registration and abstract submission will be open on May 31st, uh, just in time for the World No Tobacco Day celebration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your invaluable insight. That was Michelle Reyes, Technical Advisor on Tobacco Control to the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease of the Union. Well, perfect stage to go to our final expert before we have the open session. Uh, it's now to Chloe Franco. Chloe is a senior international organizer at the COP to the Accountability International and also heads the leadership of the Network for Accountability of Tobacco, Transnationals or NET. Chloe Franco and NET leaders have been on these webinars as experts before too. Thanks for the help, NET. Over to you, Chloe. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you all so much for having me today. Um, um, as I was introduced, my name is Chloe Franco. I'm with Corporate Accountability International. Um, we are a civil society organization based in the United States that collaborates with our partners across the globe to protect public health and human rights and the environment from corporate abuse. Um, and today, I'll pick up um, right where Ms. Ray has left off to, to further connect how curbing tobacco industry interference advances the sustainable development goals. Um, so first, as, as you all know, um, the, UN, the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, include 17 goals for this 15-year period. Um, and as tobacco is a significant barrier to development. Um, many of these goals um, can be advanced through tobacco control. Um, and I will choose just two to hone in on today. And those are goal three, focused on health, and goal 16, focused on accountable and inclusive institutions. 
So first, um, the objective of goal three of the SDGs is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages. Um, and specifically, 3A, Measure 3A, as has been mentioned, um, encourages countries to implement the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control or Global Tobacco Treaty. While tobacco industry interference is the greatest impediment to implementation of the FCTC, um, this in interference takes the form of um, lobbying, uh, bribery, conflicts of interest, both financial and, and otherwise, um, and also mobilizing front groups. And as such, through reining in the interference of big, of big Tobacco, we have the greatest opportunity to advance the SDGs, um, and especially, most directly, to achieve Measure 3A. Um, for instance, taxation is largely recognized as one of the most effective um, and cost-effective means of reducing tobacco rates. But the tobacco industry has launched an all-out campaign against raising taxes, as Ms. Reyes clarified um, in the, the syntax law in the Philippines. Um, and the industry advocates against these policies through creating ties with finance ministries, activating front groups, and manufacturing false science. And so through countering this interference, we were, are able to advance taxation measures as um, advocates in the Philippines did so effectively. Fortunately, the FCTC includes a groundbreaking article, Article 5.3, that does just this. It protects against tobacco industry interference. This is the backbone of the treaty. Um, by moving the industry's interference out of the way, the door is open for countries to successfully pass life-saving tobacco control policies, um, like taxation policies, like policies that ban tobacco marketing, and those that set age limits. Now, the guidelines for Article 5.3 recommend that countries um, raise awareness of tobacco industry interference, limit interactions with the tobacco industry to those that are strictly necessary for regulation and require transparency in those interactions that do occur. These guidelines also prohibit partnerships with the tobacco industry, um, prohibit conflicts of interest for government officials, again, whether um, these are financial or employment related. Um, and they ban corporate social responsibility, which the World Health Organization recognizes as thinly veiled marketing. And goal 16 is to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Some measures for achieving Goal 16 include reducing corruption and bribery, developing effective, accountable, and transparent institutions, and providing access to justice as listed directly in the goal. And Big, to big Tobacco drives corruption and hinders good governance. So through reigning in Big Tobacco, we have an enormous opportunity to advance good governance um, and advance the sustainable development goals, specifically goal 16. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on one way that we are able to do that. So Article 19 of the FCTC empowers countries to hold the tobacco industry legally liable, um, whether civilly or criminally, thereby advancing good governance directly. As such, through successfully litigating against the industry for violating laws and in order to recoup healthcare costs um, from the tobacco epidemic, countries are able to compensate for harms and generate resources directly um, in a similar way to taxation. 
also to punish wrongdoing and even stop those abuses directly, whether that is something like bribery or something like, um, like marketing of tobacco products to youth, is also able to denormalize the industry and its interference, um, and even directly discourage smoking. For instance, if, um, if corporations are paying the cost of healthcare associated with the tobacco epidemic, prices of um, its tobacco products will eventually go up, causing consumption to go down directly. A few countries, um, namely the United States and Canada, have already successfully litigated against the industry, recouping billions of dollars from the industry um, and shifting the burden onto the industry. And there is untold potential to advance tobacco industry liability in other countries and shift the costs back onto the industry around the world. And this in turn has the potential to dramatically change the tobacco control lab landscape through making it more difficult for big tobacco to violate laws and ultimately get its products into the hands of young people. So I wanna take a, a moment to share a quick case study that relates to these two issues. Um, as some of you might be aware, in 2015, a whistleblower from British American Tobacco revealed documentation of years and years of systematic bribery by British American Tobacco employees throughout East Africa, from Kenya to Rwanda. And these bribes were used, among other purposes, to, to get government officials to weaken and delay life-saving policies. So how would Articles 5.3 on tobacco industry interference and 19 on tobacco industry liability have protected against such horrible actions? And how could they still do so? The implementation of Article 5.3 would have stopped VAT officials from having access to government officials in the first place thereby making it um, significantly more difficult, if not impossible, to carry out these bribes. And secondly, laws that enable corporations to be held liable um, in line with Article 5.3 in these countries would have potentially deterred such behavior due to fear of repercussions. Um, and they could certainly be used after the fact to hold BAT liable for its abuses. And the good news is that, in, in fact, Kenya has already launched a formal investigation into these bribery allegations, which is the first step toward holding BAT liable for these abuses. And late last year, the government passed a new and stronger anti-corruption act, which will not only enable the government to hold BAT accountable for its bribery, but will have a cross-cutting effect of strengthening anti-corruption and accountability across a range of issues in Kenya, <clears throat> thereby <clears throat> directly advancing um, good governance in the country. <clears throat> so in summary, through curbing the abuses of the tobacco industry, we have a huge opportunity to advance the sustainable development goals. Tobacco industry interference um, stalls implementation of the FCTC. It impedes good governance, and it creates a huge economic burden on governments. And last but not least, it costs millions of lives. And Article 5.3 on tobacco industry interference advances good governance and paves the way for demand reduction. Um, for instance, taxation measures. And finally, Article 19 on tobacco industry liability enables countries to recoup healthcare costs, shifting the burden back on the industry and stops abusive and illicit behaviors, um, including but not li limited to bribery. Um, and all of these serve to effectively um, give a strong boost to advancing SDGs in countries that are advancing 
um, tobacco control and specifically advancing the most important provisions in the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And that is it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was the voice of Chloe Franco, who is a senior international organizer at the Corporate Accountability International and also heads the leadership of the Network for Accountability of Tobacco Transnationals, or NET. That brings us to the end of experts' presentation. And now we begin the final session, an open session. This session has two more experts joining in. Dr. Sangamitra Party is the senior scientist and director of Regional Medical Research Center of the Indian Council of Medical Research, or ICMR. Welcome, Dr. Party. Raul Duvedi, who is the director of Vote for, for Health, campaign will also join in. Participants, please keep sending your questions using chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. It's now open session begins now. We are hand over to our Madam Shobha Shukla. Thank you, Ashok. Uh, we now begin this open session. We have not many questions already which have reached us. Questions are streaming in and I request the participants to please keep on sending your questions. Aradha Joshi of Gurdaspur, India wants to know the prevalence of tobacco is high in youth or in adults. Uh, would Dr. Ramakant like to reply to that question? Right. And uh, I'm sure it is very clear that uh, they start in the uh, adolescent period, but uh, it is in youth, it is less than the adults because they then miss most of them who have started, some of them continue, and the adult time, the stresses and those things are coming up more. So therefore, the prevalence is higher in adult and it still goes on higher with increasing ages. Okay, thank you. And would Rahul Devedi, he is uh, just on the borderhood of youth and <laughs> a youth. So Rahul, would you like to add something to what Dr. Sab has said? Uh, as we all know that tobacco consumption is an uh, addiction uh, and not a disease. It, it causes uh, killer diseases. But uh, if you see the data, more than 80% of tobacco addiction begins among uh, children and youth in both developed and developing countries. And that is why industries tobacco promotion tactic target youth through direct, indirect, and surrogate advertisements and uh, uh, and also misleading promotions for example uh, tobacco depictions in uh, films and cinemas so according to uh, global adult tobacco survey around 30 percent of adults uh, use tobacco some in some form in india and as uh, professor dr ramakan mentioned in his presentation that quitting tobacco is possible so i think uh, scaling up tobacco cessation services at the district and block level uh, and along with uh, effective implementation of uh, tobacco control laws can help us save many lives and we must ensure that no child or no youth or no adult begins tobacco use in any form thank you uh, alma shamim has a question for Chloe. Uh, Almas wants to know how effective is such an article like 5.3 in FCTC? Recently, a big NGO lost its FCRA in India reportedly because of anti tobacco lobbying. That's a great question, um, and I think it gets right to the heart of the matter that Article 5.3 is, is only as good as its implementation. Um, so what's What's really important now is to recognize that <clears throat> Article 5.3 sets um, really strong priorities for countries to advance tobacco control through um, curbing the influence of the tobacco industry over um, the government especially, but also the public. Um, and what's important to do now that we have this really great article um, and some really clear guidelines set for for countries to implement this article of the treaty um, is that it's absolutely critical that that governments move ahead policies that protect against such influence and lobbying. Um, and most most importantly, um, many countries many countries begin by advancing a 
code of conduct conduct that monitors the the ways that um, that, public officials um, officials are able to to, um, interact uh, or ideally not interact with the tobacco industry. Um, and that's a key first step. Um, the other piece that I would mention in an example such as, as the one that you mentioned um, is that Article 5.3 is enshrined in global international law. And so there's also a great opportunity to, um, to raise Article 5.3 as an, um, as an opportunity to call out behaviors where the tobacco industry is interfering, for instance, in this example. Um, And that has been done effectively in a number of countries around the world, including um, in Colombia, in order to um, raise the um, awareness about tobacco industry interference and curb um, illicit activities, even if Article 5.3 is not enshrined in international law or in in domestic law. Uh, Thank you, Chloe. Uh, Vikrant wants to know uh, if that there are reports of tobacco placement in Hollywood. Is there any data from Indian Bollywood? <laughs> Dr. Sangmitra. Uh, or would Dr. Sangmitra answer that question? Uh, Dr. Ramakant, would you like to say something about that? Something is sure. By all means, uh, there has been a reduction of showing you know, tobacco products being used in films, and it was much higher before. And uh, the effect had been proved that if somebody is smoking, a hero or someone, the uh, adolescent age group or even uh, young adults, they were also excited and they took it wrongly. So therefore, uh, exact data is difficult to tell, but nowadays, definitely it is seen that the incidence of showing this has become less. And on the same time, there's always a warning which is going on right in the beginning and also when, that, when the film is running. We have another question for you, Dr. Ramakant. Uh, yes. from, uh, from Archana Trivedi, uh, she wants to know that tobacco cessation clinics and public health facilities are not very much functional. Any plans for strengthening them? Uh, actually, if I tell the truth, the point was that when we started from WHO's assistance, and nearly nine uh, years it was, the grants were given and we were trained for that, and it was n- nicely running. We achieved targets like anything. It was a great pleasure seeing people quitting tobacco. But after that, it was passed on to, to government control. And that is the situation which I am observing and we are seeing that what is happening is the cessation services have become very poor, very, very poor, because nobody is interested. And uh, the people who are there, they are, I don't think they are trained. The counselors have to be clinical counselors who should be very much you know, expert in their field. And on the same time, one thing which I showed in one of my slides, that remember, nothing will work unless we have got sympathy. Sympathy has to be there. We cannot change people. We have to change, you know, make ourselves involved with them. And we have seen one of the worst users, they were chain smokers or using tobacco to a great extent, by you know, efforts for counseling, repeated counseling, and ensuring them and assuring them that when they fail and they come back to relapse, then we were saying them that the, every stair of failure is leading you towards the quitting. So therefore, actually, the services at present, are, I will rank it as pitiable because cessation services, unless they are good, the control will not succeed. And that is one of the points which should be very important, must be you know ensured, and uh, that is not uh, the satisfactory at present. And the, as regard, if you ask my future, what are the you know preparations or something what is happening? I don't think there is anything much stressed on this, although we keep on speaking about it and expressing everywhere. But honestly speaking, most important link of success for tobacco free world is at present one of the you know it's a weakest. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, participants, please keep on sending your questions. We already have a lot many questions streaming in. We have a question from Tuemo Hedullah from Namibia. Uh, the Namibian government is in the process of leasing 10,000 hectares of Namibian land in Zambezi region to a Chinese company to grow tobacco. This is despite the fact that the Namibian government recognized that there is an irreconcilable conflict of interest between public health and the tobacco industry. Can WHO intervene at all? Will Namibia ever rid the use of tobacco? if they now have to start growing it again. 
Would any of the panelists like to answer? Chloe, would you please go I'll be ahead? Happy to. Absolutely. Um, I think that this is I think that this question raises a really good point. Um, which is um, kind of as I said earlier that the the law is only as good as its implementation and so it's it's absolutely crucial to to focus on implementation and enforcement of tobacco control laws um, and um, for better or worse um, we as members of civil society and members of the media are in the best positions to hold our our governments and, and decision makers accountable um, for implementing these really crucial and life-saving tobacco control measures. Um, unfortunately, the World Health Organization is, is not in a position to intervene against, um, against this sort of um, land leasing to China to grow tobacco. Um, that being said, I think if Namibia has already recognized the conflict of interest between the tobacco industry and public health, then that is absolutely the first step towards um, advancing strong tobacco control laws that can um, raise awareness of um, the influence of the tobacco industry um, and begin the process of undermining the, the economic arguments um, that, I, that I imagine convinced the, the, Namib the Namibian government um, to accept this um, proposal from China to, to lease land for growing further tobacco in the country. Thank you. Uh, there is a question for Michelle. Uh, Michelle, in uh, the latest GATS uh, in the Philippines says that there are 25% uh, adult smokers. Uh, how does it compare with the data from the last survey? Is there uh, a downfall in the number of smokers or increase or how does it compare with the earlier data? So for the earlier data, actually it shows a significant de decline uh, comparing it to the 2009 GATS data because of the many initiatives being um, um, implemented currently by the government, uh, eh, both the national government as well as the local government units on smoke-free as well as in syntax, on graphic health and all that sorts. What was the number of smokers in 2009? What did the data say? So in uh, 2009, um, the over uh, there's uh, overall there's a 19.9 .9 relative reduction from 2009 comparing it to 2015. So um, overall um, in 20. In 2009, there's 29.7 percent. Uh, that's a combination of both men and women. While in 2015, it's already down to 23.8 percent. Thank you. All thanks to the efforts, or combined efforts. Uh, yes. Ashok Ramsarup. Ashok Ramsarup wants to ask a question. Yes, actually, what I'd like to know is: Is it true that uh, electronic smokers have a high risk of bladder cancer? Anyone could answer? The panelist? Uh, Dr. Saroop, I'll tell, say about that part. The specific you know, electronic uh, going, giving a higher concentration of nicotine, that uh, is not very well connected with the higher incidence, but it, naturally the incidence of cancer is almost the same. Every, in all types of you know uh, use of tobacco and electronic cigarettes, there are so many types available. There are so many types of uh, which are which are even causing heating and not burning. But they have been found because most of them damage more of the lungs and cause cardiovascular diseases. So, a specific high incidence of bladder cancer is definitely associated with aniline dye workers, but not with the smoking, as far as my knowledge goes. Thank you kindly, uh, Prof Ji. Thank you. Uh, Premjit from uh, Manipur wants to know why NTCP is not active in his state of Manipur still. Government uh, program is very unsatisfactory. I know about so many states, but except barring, uh, I think, uh, to some extent, we can say of South India and uh, some places, but otherwise, uh, this is not very effective. It has to really improve. 
that is the truth which I can say. Javad Ahmed from Pakistan has a question for Michel. Uh, Javad says that the successful use of syntax is welcome. What can we do to have this in our country, Pakistan also? Mm, that's a very good question and uh, I, I'm very delighted to know that he, you know uh, he's interested to actually have it also in his country. But you see, um, I think number one, uh, 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 the first thing you have to, to, to know is um, how the syntax law actually um, uh, was made successful here in the Philippines. First, it's actually a combination of efforts of the government as well as um, the, the civil society organization as well as the Department of Health. Uh, that is what we call the the, the equation uh, back then because um, when syntax law was actually um, being talked about back in 2012, it just so you know it's it it's as if the universe um conspired or actually um the stars aligned for us because um the government is actually looking for ways on how to raise enough funds uh in order to uh, f uh fund the universal healthcare program and one of the ways is to actually um have this syntax law so it it, it in a way we we just um sort of um, fill in the need of uh, and the timing was right back then so if if just to answer your question uh, first you have to determine whether um, the government is also really keen on having this number two you have a very strong civil society uh, who's really pushing for uh, your 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 tobacco excise taxes to be raised and you have a, a strong leader a strong leadership in your ministry of health so that's the that's the equation. Thank you. Uh, we have a professor for Dr. Ramakant uh, from uh, a clinical instructor Urvashi from his alma mater from KGMU. Urvashi wants to know how can be tobacco consumption be controlled in a population who cannot access the media and awareness programs on tobacco cessation in India, yeah. of course. In India. The it's very simple. The answer lies in Ur Urvashi itself. She must make an effort. You should not bother about anything. We have done it. We did not find, you know, look for any supports or something. You know about the hazards and you can take help of some surgeon, physician, psychologist and such a team always, you know, can, can work and start educating people from, for example, starting from a school education program. You can go to the you know factories, you can go to the offices, you can go to the banks. We have been to the platform, we have to bus stops. So everywhere you start showing some programs according to the situation which is available. Wherever you can show slides, it's okay. Wherever you can show posters, which can be very easily available, you can make it. Help take help from the blue source, they provide posters. So that is important that uh, I think somebody has to take a lead and uh, once you take a lead then you find the people start following you. So I think the, instead of depending on who is going to help and how to make awareness, this can be started by anyone and I think you being from King George, you, you must be the first person to do it. We have done it, we are doing it and we will keep on doing. So therefore Rishi, I think th this is the best chance that you go ahead and start making this and you will find that you will make a difference in the world. Thank you. Uh, Rajesh Bhalla has a very pertinent and uh, interesting question. Uh, he says, can we induct the awareness program on tobacco in mid and high school uh, students to counsel youngsters at an early age? Uh, before any other expert answers, I would like to say I have been into the teaching profession. I think this indeed must be done and this is an opportunity for Ministry of Health and the National T uh, to uh, Tobacco Control Program to work with the Education Ministry and the Human Resource uh, uh, Ministry uh, to work together and initiate the youth against tobacco use. I think, would any of the other experts like to say something? But I'll say, I think you're already aware about it, that we started from there. We started from the school, you know, and colleges. And this is, the, I think, the best group which we are talking. 
that they are talking about. This is the most, you know, benefited group, and therefore this should be done. Sure, that is the time when we should start. That is the best time. Thank you, Roger Paul Kamugasha, editor of Health Times from Africa, has a question for Chloe. Uh, advocacy is one of the main components of the tobacco endgame, but how do we find enough resources? Um, goodness, that's the golden question, isn't it, about how we resource tobacco control? Um, I would say that there um, are a number of, of options. Um, one is that there is significant funding for tobacco control right now um, through a number of, um, of organizations and entities. For instance, um, Bloomberg is a, a huge funder of tobacco control. Um, I think another argument that I would make specifically relating back to the issue of um, World No Tobacco Day on s the Sustainable Development Goals um, is that one of the priorities um, of ensuring that that the FCTC was directly mentioned in the Sustainable Development Goals um, is to ensure that our governments, as they are developing their, um, their plans for reaching the Sustainable Development Goals, are um, allocating funds and prioritizing tobacco control within that. Um, so I would say that's a, a really good focus to ensure that we have um, funds to carry out our tobacco control activity. Thank you. Uh, uh, Premjit Thokcham again wants the, uh, has a request from Dr. for Dr. Ramakan. He says that I would like to open an effective tobacco cessation center inside my office. Uh, what is the protocol and kindly advise me on this? Uh, Madam, it's uh, very simple. I can summarize this. I can help him also. I don't know where is he. But anyway, what is the basic thing required is that you should have a, somebody who is a counselor. Preferably, if you want really good success, then it should be a clinical psychologist who should have experience of dealing with patients and counseling. That is the most important thing which you start. Then there should be a physician who should assess the hazards of the tobacco use the person has already used. So you can find out what are the you know damages done, what are the comorbidities that should be done. Next is that if you can uh, uh, start uh, that clinic, once you start evaluating the addiction status, what is the intensity, how severe it is. Because if it is very severe, then you may have to have replacement therapy. Otherwise, very most of the patient, patients will be very easily dealt with with counseling and minor you know, pharmacotherapy like bupropion or some, some other things. So what is important, basic thing is there should be a, a room from where a, a psychologist you must have to arrange. Even it is said, and at some places in Mankapur, other places, I have tried also that doctor was available, but counselor was not available. So we made somebody who is a non-psychologist, but counselor. But my own experience is that uh, that success, if you want to achieve, and uh, satisfaction you want to achieve in your work, then you should have a counselor along with you. So with these things, gradually you can have. And actually, cessation uh, requires some scientific training also, and. Uh, that can be provided by any you know psychiatric centers and de addiction centers who are available in your own city or some places. And I, if you want, I can tell you many more. Uh, there is a question from Sumita Thapar, a very senior journalist. Uh, she says that uh, Dr. Ramakan said in his presentation that poverty causes tobacco use and tobacco use causes poverty. But I yes. have seen in Uttar Pradesh young people using tobacco to curb hunger. Is this common? Does tobacco suppress hunger? It, it has been said so for it has been said for women also, doctors, in the villages that uh, sometimes yes. they eat tobacco to suppress yes. hunger. You're absolutely right because uh, we have worked with kill, kill, uh, kill workers, bhatta workers, and all those, and uh, we have found that they, they are this is true. They want to kill their appetite, even to the extent if you talk of the even um, classes which are rich classes. Some of them are so misguided that they think if we take tobacco or do something, then what is going to happen is the appetite is killed and they, want, they take it for reducing weight, which is absolutely wrong. So therefore, see, the, this is a pitiable situation and very you know, shocking that I've, I've come across so many persons who say because they don't have any food to eat. So therefore, you remember that what I said is absolutely true. They will take this thing for reducing appetite or uh, curbing appetite, but then develop diseases which will make more poverty and create problem for them. So this is the truth, absolutely correct.
Uh, Mahesh Gurla wants to know how TB tobacco collaboration can help in reduction in tobacco consumption. Uh, for this, uh, Dr. Sanjay Gehlot, District TB Officer of Sirohi say, says, he had sent a comment that we have already linked the National TB Control Program with National Tobacco Control Program and patients attending tobacco cessation centers are screened for symptoms of TB and TB patients who smoke uh, attending TB centers are advised to quit smoking. Uh, Dr. Ramakant, can you say what is the reality on ground if the TCC was linked to RNTCP or is it now linked, are the two linked? Uh, no, no, I don't think it is very, there may be some, you know, specific cases where it has been linked, but otherwise, this is definitely one thing is important, that tuberculosis you know, experts and the pulmonary medicine experts are taking up tobacco cessation also together. But as such, this is a very good idea and this should be actually done. And uh, this is important for any respiratory disease. Everybody will ask in the history of, you know, smoking and uh, smoke exposure. So therefore, this is definitely, uh, I think, welcome idea. And uh, gradually, this is also been already in King George. We are finding that the tuberculosis experts are definitely involved in uh, controlling the tuberculosis cessation also. Uh, and uh, there is a one comment from Rakesh Gupta that anybody who wishes to work for cessation should connect with the state or district tobacco control cell for assistance and getting trained. Uh, we have already overshot the time by more than 15 minutes. Uh, thank you participants for sending the questions. Questions are still streaming in. But we now come to the end of this webinar. Much as I would hate to leave, but the time is already up. Thank you panelists and participants for being with us today and making this a very lively discussion. As always, the recording of the webinar will be made available to all of you soon. Bye and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.